Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Anita Rizbeitia, Professor and Chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture. And I'm very pleased to welcome you tonight to a lecture by Catherine Sievet Nordenson. Before we begin, a quick reminder that Catherine will respond to questions after she has finished her lecture, but please feel free to submit your questions into the queue at any time by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. We also have live captioning available for this event that you can enable by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. Finally, I want to invite you to join us tomorrow, March 12th at 1 p.m. for Mayors Imagining the Just City, a symposium featuring the seven inaugural Mayors Institute on City Design Just City Mayoral Fellows. They will discuss how to tackle racial injustices in each of their cities through planning and design interventions. And on Tuesday, March 23rd at 7.30 p.m., editors Mark Lee and Florencia Rodriguez will reveal Harvard Design Magazine number 48, America, coming together for a discussion with a panel of contributors. Please check our website for more information on these and other events. I am very pleased to welcome Catherine Sievet Nordenson tonight. As an architect and landscape architect, she has crafted a career trajectory in which practice, scholarly work, design research, advocacy, and teaching are closely intertwined. For the past decade and a half, she has explored the intersection of landscape, environment, and politics, leading a conversation that raises the fundamental question of the role of design in society. Responding to the catastrophic failure of the levees in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrine in 2005, Catherine was an early advocate of the use of soft infrastructure, those liminal dynamic and ecological structures that make cities adaptable to sea level rise and large storm events. In advocating for the replacement of hard protective barriers with soft ones, Catherine and her collaborators, Guy Nordenson and Adam Jarinski, made the argument that hard barriers present not only greater risk for those areas not protected, but that these would exacerbate conditions of environmental injustice in cities affected by large-scale storm events such as New Orleans and the New York metropolitan area. Out of this research came several important publications. On the Water, Palisade Bay, published in 2010, with an accompanying exhibition at the Venice Biennale, was a study of the bathymetry of the New York Harbor, a history of its transformation over centuries of human intervention, and a series of design speculations about its future. This work was the basis of the Museum of Modern Art's 2010 Rising Currents, a series of workshops and exhibitions that demonstrated the power of design and visualization in catalyzing public debate around climate change. Waterproofing New York of 2016, co-edited with Denise Hoffman Brandt, is an interdisciplinary collection of essays and projects that explore the impact of large storms in the city's infrastructure. And structures of Coastal Resilience of 2018 brought together academics and practitioners to address reconstruction efforts after Hurricane Sandy. In addition to these books, Catherine has published numerous articles in journals and anthologies. One of my favorites is a 2013 essay in Art Forum, co-authored with Guy Nordenson, titled River's Edge, Climate Change and Risk Assessment, that makes the case for the importance of design as a translator of data. And I quote, art and design can mediate between the statistical abstractions of risk and its material and cultural effects. They can also reimagine risks influence on how we build and inhabit our cities or go about our daily lives. We need an art and design of risk to bring the science of risk back to reality, end quote. While all of this research and advocacy efforts on climate adaptation is taking place, Catherine advanced a long-standing, a long-term research project on the political work of Roberto Burle Marx, who between 1967 and 1974 served as counselor to Brazil's military regime 
in the Federal Council of Culture. In her 2018 book, Depositions, Roberto Burle Marx and the Public Landscapes Under Dictatorship, she addresses the confluence of politics, developmentalism, and environmental protection in Brazil. Her groundbreaking research reveals how the turn from democracy to a conservative neoliberal dictatorship marked a shift in Burle Marx's career from design to environmental advocacy in the face of unregulated developmental pressures. Although this research explores conditions in another geography, political context, and historical time, I see an underlying commitment in her work to investigating the broader issue of how design engages those consequential matters that affect us all. Tonight, we will hear about her current research on yet another timely topic, how concerns for public health shaped the future of cities and their public landscapes and infrastructure during the second half of the 19th century through an examination of the work of sanitary engineer George E. Waring Jr. Welcome to the GSD, Catherine. It is wonderful that you are with us tonight. I pass the, the screen on to you. Great, thank you so much, Anita. What a wonderful introduction. It's great to be here, the GSD. Um, and I just thank you so much for all of your support over these years. I think we have a fellow love of Roberto Burle Marx and all things South American. So I thank you so much for all of those, um, those kind words. Um, I also should acknowledge that this work is being funded by the Graham Foundation. Uh, as well as a grant from the Foundation for Landscape Studies. It's the subject of a new book that I'll be working on with my editor, Robert Devins, at the University of Texas Press. Um, the Miasmus, George E. Waring Jr. and Landscapes of Public Health. A little bit about George E. Waring. He's a marginal figure, um, so I'll give a very brief introduction about one of his most uh, important works. In 1867, he published an influential manual entitled Draining for Profit, Draining for Health, reflecting three obsessions of the Gilded Age, wealth, health, and miasma. Waring, appointed by Frederick Law Olmsted as superintendent of drainage for New York's Central Park, supported the long-held miasma theory, insisting that the source of disease was connected to the environment and spread through the air as a poisonous vapor, emerging through rotting organic matter or damp soil. By the 1880s, the new contagionist theory of the germ was gaining support in Europe, yet Waring remained a lifelong miasmist in the United States. He applied his technical knowledge of farm drainage to an urban theory of public sanitation, beginning with the 1858 drainage plan for Central Park, continuing as a set with san sanitation studies for, me for Memphis, and culminating as the commissioner of the Department of Street Cleaning in New York City, followed by a brief tour of Cuba. This was a mechanistic battle against miasma that sought to modify the climate and therefore, and thereby improve public health through a significant transformation of the urban landscape. Though Waring conducted his work on scientifically unsound precepts, his conclusions were unexpectedly successful. Given the miasmus interest in urban disease transfer, particularly the spread of cholera and yellow fever, Waring's emphasis on the sanitation of the physical environment and the reduction of standing water, which in turn destroyed the habitat of mosquito larvae, led him to fail brilliantly. He's an important but un unsung hero of urban environmental history. Um, and of course, we know that conditions such as health have constantly transformed our landscapes and think of the cholera epidemics, which uh, really were in instrumental in producing Central Park in New York. So reading that introduction, I, I think back to how I first started on this work about a couple of years ago, um, particularly through some Society of Architectural Historian uh, panels. And I always thought this was a kind of really interesting idea of a brilliant failure, that there was a great mind somehow incorrect in thinking that disease was in the air and that in fact the disease was a germ, like the disease couldn't be emanating from the earth as a miasmic vapor, as you see in this image uh, rising from the streets of London. But in fact, maybe he was right. And I think that what's given me pause over the last year is this idea that in fact, it is in the air. There is a, pro a way of kind of thinking about the atmosphere and breath that is something that is about health. And I like to refer to this incredible 
manifesto, the maintenance manifesto of 1969 by Mural Lederman Eucles. And her statement about um, the maintenance or the art of maintenance and how critical this is when we think about health as well. Um, she says, of course, letter B, two basic systems, development and maintenance, the sour ball of every revolution. Who's going to pick up the garbage on Monday morning? This was a kind of question that Waring was concerned with. Here's another image of um, later Manu Kelly's with I make, make Maintenance Art One Hour Every Day from 1976, in which she worked with um, essential workers to make art in their work as maintenance. Uh, here we see Hartford Wash, 1973, in which she scrubs the steps and the walk in front of the Anthenaeum in Hartford. This has resonance with Waring's work. And in fact, Merrill told me she believes that Waring is the first uh, performance artist, in fact. And his work with New York City Street Cleaning was a performance of maintenance. In fact, to the extent that lavish parades were held in which the sanitation workers in the Department of Street Cleaning would parade up Fifth Avenue dressed in white duck cotton uh, uniforms being visible during the day. Here are some of the horse carts, which would pick up um, refuse and garbage from around the city. Merrill implemented a similar uh, performance with the Department of uh, New York City Department of Sanitation in 1977 uh, called Touch Sanitation, in which she personally went out into the streets of New York on every beat of every sanitation route and shook hands with 8,500 sanitation workers saying to each one, thank you for keeping New York alive. This handshake ritual is very um, reminiscent in some ways of this idea that visibility and performance are much more than just performative acts, but in fact, um, active and alive. The last image here, the social mirror, is a mirrored garbage truck, which she paraded in the New York City Art Parade with creative time in 1983, uh, which was concluded with a ceremonial sweep, with these same um, street brushes, which were developed by Waring for his department of street cleaning. And she continues to do work of maintenance, uh, art, choreography, and testing these lines, I think, which are so pertinent today, these questions of gender, labor, and the environment and how they intersect. So how did Waring become this performative and performing artist as a sanitation engineer? Um, he's born in 1833, and his first position, in fact, is a uh, job with um, the incredible printer and uh, journalist Horace Greeley. So Greeley is actually um, a gentleman farmer. He's working in New York at the press, of course, with the newspaper. Uh, but here's his, his press corps. But he's also purchased a small property up in Chappaqua, New York. And part of that property uh, is a boggy area, low grove area, which he wants to develop as a farm. So he hires the young George Waring, just 20 years old at that time, who's just completed a book um, about uh, farming. So he sees this young man as the farm manager who might be able to bring this land to a state of farmability. The book from 1953 by Waring is entitled The Elements of Agriculture, a book for young farmers, um, first printed in 1953, but then revised in 1980, or sorry, 1868 and 1885. The first section is about the plant. And we see that Waring's interests are not about disease or maintenance, but really about um, the question of farming. So he begins in this very interesting place of scientific farming. Um, he states, to understand the plant, one must actually break it down into its atmospheric and mo molecular parts. So he writes, the, that part which burns away during combustion, which we will call atmospheric matter, because it was derived by the plant from the air. The ashes which remain, we will call earthy matter, because they were derived from the soil. The atmospheric matter has become air, and it was originally obtained from air. The earthy matter, matter has become earth and was obtained from the soil. So we see here these two concerns of earth and, and air as elements um, that are, have an interchange. 
The other important thing, and this is part of the reason why Greeley was so interested in working with wearing, was his notion of mechanical cultivation. And within this chapter in this farming manual, a uh, chapter entitled Advantages of Underdraining, which is a tiling or draining mechanically the soil to reduce water. And he states, the two great rules of mechanical cultivation are thorough underdraining, deep and frequent disturbance of the soil. And these are illustrations which come from his later draining for profit, draining for health, but are appearing in his reprints of this book. Um, the clay pipes, which he uses as part of his draining technique, technique and the trenches that he um, develops in which the, the pipes are laid. And this is the field at, where, at the uh, Greeley farm, which was drained and tiled by Waring. He also insists on this turning of the earth and plowing. So you can see the steel plow here and then the improved Knox's horse hoe here as well. Um, and these do appear in period photographs. This is 1855, Harris, Horace Greeley with a ladder in the woods and at his concrete barn with the steel plow. This image, it's suspected that the man, the likely person in the image here is indeed George Waring. And you can see in the, in the kind of shadows on the upper left, uh, Greeley's house in the woods, built in 1854. Greeley, of course, had a, a run for the presidency, um, did not win, but he did start to engage the public space of his uh, forest as part of his campaign. This is him shortly before the end of his life. He actually wrote for the Her for the New York Tribune, a newspaper column called What I Know of Farming, Practical Agriculture. And that was compiled into a book in 1870 in which he actually starts to speak about this interest in draining that he's played out on his farm and recommends wearing within his book as well. I shall not attempt to give instructions in drain making, but I urge every novice in the art to procure wearings or some other work on the subject and study it carefully. Then, if he can obtain at a fair price the services of an experienced drainer, hire him to supervise the work. The book that um, where begins Waring's kind of writing career, he writes over eight to ten books during his uh, prolific career, um, is essentially looking again at this question of farming. So we don't see much about disease, but there's this one note that it, that occurs towards the end of the book. One very important, though not strictly agricultural effect of thorough drainage is its removal of certain local diseases peculiar to the vicinity of marshy or low moist soils. The health reports in several places in England show that where fever and og was once common, it has almost entirely disappeared since the general use of underdrains in those localities. So we hear a little bit about this question of health, which will become the subject of his next most important uh, text, Draining for Profit and Draining for Health, in which he lays out plans about how to implement a series of tile drains um, drawn perpendicularly to the slope. These are laid in in this fishbone or herringbone pattern, as you see on the right here, and direct that water subgrade to the source of the stream. And he even includes illustrations of the, the tools used uh, to trench the uh, ditches in which the, the um, pipes will be laid. Mm. In 1857, Waring moves to New York City and is hired by um, Egbert Veeley to work as a sanitary engineer for the new project of Central Park. And this is a pretty important shift. He moves, in fact, to the farmhouse of George uh, of Frederick Law Olmsted um, on Staten Island. So, in fact, he meets Olmsted through family friends, is in, and is a larger at his farm, a lodger at his farm. Um, but Olmsted has not yet begun working for the park. So, in fact, Waring is there before him, working directly with um, Egbert Veeley. Uh, this is the Act, the Senate and Assembly of the State of New York Central Park Act of 1857, which sets aside a described area of land which shall become the Central Park. And here, a very early 1836 um, topographic map of the, the middle section of Manhattan, where you can see a faint orange sepia outline indicating the land that would become 
the Central Park. Vili is a surveyor, General Egbert Vili, trained at West Point. Um, and in this image, you can see that he's um, you know, in his military costume. He hires Waring to execute a drainage survey with him. Um, this is probably his most well-known map. It's the sanitary and topographic map of the city and island of New York, 1865, which has those three colors of marsh, meadow, and made land, the made land being those fringes of brown around the lower part of Manhattan. This detail shows you the area that will become Central Park and the lowlands of the new reservoir. But he also goes through a very precise um, study and survey of that territory of the Central Park as described in the act. Um, and this is the first uh, critical, critically and carefully constructed survey. And every building here that's colored in red will be destroyed for the clearing of the park um, territory as public park, uh, which of course we know Seneca Village was one of those settlements within the footprint described as the Central Park of the Freed Black Community that was founded in 1825. Um, Vili then updates this map and creates what he proposes to be a good plan for the park. Um, so you can see the survey on the top, the receiving reservoir exists within the space already that's being set aside. This is 1856. And at the same time, Vili draws a proposal for a public park um, with the meandering lanes and gardens within. When you look at this comparison, you can see again, Vili's survey, um, I have a detail here at the new reservoir, the old reservoir and Seneca Village, and then the translation into this image of a park-like space. And of course we see the erasure of all of the pre-existing buildings. And then he goes on with George Waring. So this is the first collaborative work that they do to begin a drainage plan for the park to start thinking about how to bring water out of the marshy areas of the park um, as delineated by Vili. This is in 1856-57. The commissioners, however, find this a rather appalling image and, and call for a competition to design a, a new park for the space that's been set aside. Vili enters this competition with his same drawing, entry number 28, um, and we see many entries with various uh, degrees of whimsy. Um, this is John Rink's entry number four with topiary galore. Egbert Vili, um, sorry, this is <laughs> this is mislabeled. This is I'm sorry, George Waring's. Um, Entry, in fact, he also creates an entry, The Art, the Handmaid of Nature, entry number 29, and Calbert Vox and Frederick Law Olmsted with the Greensward Plan for Central Park, entry number 33. This is the selected uh, park plan, and so these two men will go on to become the, the implementers of this design for the Greensward Plan at the Central Park. Olmsted fires Vili from the Park Commission and hires uh, Waring as his sanitary engineer. And in this photograph taken at Willowdale Arch in, the cent in Central Park in 1862, we see um, six men, all of whom are part of this kind of co-creation of the park, who are Andrew Haswell Green, who's the comptroller. Um, George Waring is the second from the left. Then we see Albert Vox, the architect. Ignaz Anton Pilat, chief gardener. Um, Jacob Ray Mould, the designer, who does much of the ornamental um, stonework for the park, Fre and Frederick Law Olmsted, of course, the landscape architect and park superintendent. So we often hear mostly about Vox and Olmsted. Um, these these are the other kind of additional design thinkers and and builders of the park as well. The miasma question is a very interesting one, and of course. Um, Olmsted was a miasmist, it can be claimed, as was Vili. And of course, I believe this is how Waring comes to understand this question of disease and damp soil. So the creation of the park and the necessity for draining the park was very much um, framed within this context of disease, uh, suppression, um, and a place for public health. And we see it very explicitly stated within draining for profit, draining for health, um, the approach that Waring now is making in terms of a connection between 
health, wetland, um, and miasma. And in the statement for this commissioner's report, um, the first annual report of the Board of Commissioners in 1859, um, this is written, the thorough drainage of the park below the old reservoir is nearly completed. The drive is for the most part graded, not only within the same area, but also extending to the north above the new reservoir. Portions of the drive intended as samples have been constructed in different methods with their superstructure in order to test the relative cost and efficiency of each. The ride for equestrians is in progress. Several miles of the walks are graded, drained, and graveled, and in a condition for use. So this is a, a report describing um, the work of the drainage system on this lower park, part of Central Park that's been completed up to the end of the year um, in 1858. And this is Waring's plan of the drainage that he now designs for the Greensward plan. Um, again, looking at the existing natural courses of waterways within the park and then bringing water through these these um, tiled um, tube systems of ceramic tubes laid into the ground as they had been done in, at Horace Greeley's farm. Um, here you can see this main, um, in black, the main drain to the upper left of this drawing. And if you look back to the survey of Vili, you can see the existing, the pre-existing stream, which essentially that main pipe is beginning is echoing and draining to the pond at the bottom left of the image in the southeastern corner of the park. And here another detail of that same uh, flow path where you start to see every one of those red herringbone structures, uh, which are the tubes that are now buried below the park, creating this mechanistic movement of water um, to the low points and draining of the grounds complete with incredible um, details of sluice gates and um, mechanisms for raising and, and lowering and controlling the levels of the pond and the lake within Central Park as well. This is the sluice gate at the southernmost pond. Of course, then the Civil War comes, 1861. So shortly after the, the work for the park has been um, thoroughly commenced, um, Olmsted is appointed General Secretary of the United States Sanitary Commission. Um, treating a, a commission appointed by Lincoln uh, in which he treats upwards, he and his commission treat upwards of 8,000 sick and wounded soldiers. And so he's the general secretary, so the third dot down um, in the commission. These are fil field hospitals for the Civil War throughout the, the nation. Likewise, Waring is drawn into the Civil War as well as major. Um, he's listed on this um, per the order of the three three soldiers at the bottom right of the image to join um, Garibaldi Guard. He's actually sent to St. Louis, Missouri, and he is their commander of the 4th Missouri Cavalry Regiment uh, from February 60, 1862 through November 1865. Um, and this is where he attains the title of Colonel this is a sheet music um, piece for his bugle march of his um, Fremont Hussars bugle march um, for his mustard cavalry. Shortly after the war, um, he moves back to the East Coast to Rhode Island, and that's where he writes Draining for Profit, Draining for Health, really a compendium of everything he's been working toward um, since the time uh, at Greeley's farm and through Central Park, this question um, of drainage and health being brought to the fore. In 1878, um, Waring is sent to Memphis, Tennessee to investigate the aftermath of the yellow fever epidemic, um, which has killed massive numbers of the population. And in fact, he looks at this question of drainage again, now layering in the narrative of sewage as well. Uh, at the city scale. So he's moved from the large park, from the farm to the large park, and now to the scale of the city. And we see here just the images of these Mississippi riverboats um, at the landing in Memphis. Um, interestingly, of course, because there's no knowledge of how yellow fever is transmitted, the fact that there's in fact a, a vector, the mosquito, which has been moving up and down the Mississippi from uh, the south, uh, is not known. So though he goes through a whole series of, of um, analyses and draining 
um, creating a new sewage map and drainage plan for the city of Memphis. This does alleviate some of the standing water, which has been the habitat of those mosquitoes, but he does not connect the mosquito and the disease at this time. So again, miasma is still the narrative and the germ theory, and the question of vector has not yet been um, discovered. He publishes his plan, and there's uh, the sewage of Memphis, and in a large, uh, another text which he writes, sewage and land drainage. So again, we start to see an expansion beyond merely the drainage of land for um, reducing water in marshy areas, but also this question of sewage and control of the sewage systems of cities. He writes, most importantly, the health question, take care of the death rate and the death rate will take care of itself. Returning to New York in 1895 uh, through 1897, he's appointed um, commissioner of the New York City Department of Street Cleaning. And it is a new reformist mayor, William Lafayette Strong, um, who appoints both George Waring as commissioner of the Department of Street Cleaning, but also Theodore Roosevelt as commissioner of the police department. So the two are um, both commissioners in the same moment under the same mayorship. Um, this period of time within New York's uh, street cleaning um, agency produces yet another book, this one, Street Cleaning and the Disposal of a City's Wastes, Methods and Results, and the Effect Upon Public Health, Public Morals, and Municipal Prosperity. Um, George Waring, again, like has, has begun to start to layer in another narrative, and this one is morality. So again, this question of the sanitary city, um, filth, disease, and morals have become entwined. Um, these are well-known images of the streets both before and after Waring's um, appointment as commissioner. And you can see the mounds of trash then completely um, cleaned through his methods, um, which are really the kind of uh, narrative of bringing a militaristic approach to the crew of sanitation workers for the city that are dubbed the White Wings, decked out in white cotton duck uh, uniforms. And we see some White Wings with the horse cart um, sweeping and with the new um, handheld hand cart for sweeping curbs as well. Snow removal was another task of the White Wings as it still is today for the Department of Sanitation. But it was really the performative aspect of this uh, notion of the removal and the maintenance of the streets where Waring is really at his finest. He creates um, such uniformity and beauty in these um, identically dressed um, force of workers. At the same time, he takes them with his equestrian steed as well from his military days uh, he leads the parade on horseback, often organizing parades with over with thousands of men along Fifth Avenue, um, celebrating that um, triumph of uh, sanitation. So indeed, the performance artist of wearing uh, plays out very explicitly in these images of the parading of the force of white wings. And of course, some of his tasks, in fact, that he he layers into not only the cleaning of garbage, but also the separation of waste and um, reduction and recycling starts to really begin uh, at its, its nascence with Waring as commissioner. The final coda to his, his varied career is in 1898 when he's invited by President McKinley to examine the situation of sanitation in the streets of Havana and he proposes the Department of Public Cleansing. And I think this quote, which is from his draft sanitary report upon his return to New York from Havana, um, is very telling. He writes, the poison of yellow fever is ponderable. It clings to low levels and usually follows the lines of greatest humidity. Like malaria, it is more active or at least more to be feared by night than by day. The danger from it in any quarter of an infected locality depends on the presence primarily of filth, secondarily of dampness, and it increases in direct proportion to the confinement and stagnation of the air. So again, we hear this notion of the air as the source of disease. 
Um, here's the uh, Cuba under Spanish rule. Of course, the Spanish-American War, uh, very short-lived in 1898, um, obtained that, that uh, island nation as an annex to the United States as part of this greater empire. And we see Waring again here. He's the first person in the front row on this arch, once again standing on an arch with a number of men um, in this effort to rethink a problem or uh, create a solution to a health crisis, as he had done so many decades earlier. Here's the entrance to Havana Harbor. And uh, he's actually back with his police commissioner, Theodore Roosevelt, is there leading the Rough Riders um, in the Spanish-American War in 1898. Um, and again, part of this ambitious um, expansionism of the U.S. in 1898, this celebratory uh, image of the eagle spreading its wings across these island nations, which have been claimed um, over the past 100 years as this expansionist um, territory of the United States. So Cuba is just one of a series of um, imperial and ambitious um, claims made by the U.S. on the rest of the globe. Uh, here you see in this map, very interestingly, uh, the line of yellow fever and the mapping of disease in this territory. So you can see the, the source, as Waring would claim in his draft report, of yellow fever came from the soils of Cuba. The issue with the, um, the issue of yellow fever, of course, in Havana and in Cuba in general, now as part of the nation of the United States, uh, is that in fact more lives of soldiers were being claimed by yellow fever than by any kind of um, casualty in war. So this is why Waring is called to examine the situation because of the ambition of the US to start looking at Cuba as another place for profit, not unlike um, looking at a farm for profit, but this, in this case, it's looking at exploiting this new colonial um, enterprise and maintaining the health of those who will be there to deploy that labor. So part of this mission to Cuba is in fact to bring um, health and sanitation to those streets. In parallel, in fact, at the same time as Waring's visit, Robert Porter goes as well to um, Cuba to look at this idea of the in industries that might be developed on the island um, and how the United States might profit from these. And we see in these images from that period, the same streets that Waring was examining as part of his report um, on the situation in Cuba. Of course, sugarcane is a major industry here. And we can see again in some of these images, again, of the same time as Waring's visit um, of the process of extraction and movement of cane um, in a massive, um, massive ways for um, extracting uh, sugarcane and syrup. Um, however, after a two week study uh, in which Waring outlines a series of plans to develop a department of street cleaning for Havana. Um, he contracts, in fact, from a mosquito bite, unbeknownst to him, yellow fever himself. And he sails back to New York, falls ill the day he returns, and dies on the second day of his return in New York. He's buried in a metal casket, in fact, actually, um, on this crematorium island, uh, Swinburne Island at the time, which was a quarantine zone uh, for those who had what was thought to be transmissible even after death with yellow fever. Mm. So he's actually taken out by the very thing that he had denied all along, the fact that it was not um, a miasmic cause. So it's interesting to reflect now like on this question of the miasmist. And simply really just two years after his death, uh, Walter Reed announces that he has discovered, in fact, um, the source of yellow fever. He writes in 1901, it has been permitted to me and my assistants to lift the impenetrable veil that has surrounded the causation of this most dreadful pest of humanity and to put it on a rational and scientific basis. The prayer that has been mine for 20 or more years that I might be permitted in some way or some time to do something to alleviate human suffering has been answered. And this is Major Walter Reed in 1900. But I think there still remains this question of the air 
um, which is another element, the connection of the atmosphere and the earth that Waring so poetically describes in his first book on farming, um, remains part of our, our um, public health concern, um, and indeed the mosquito as well. So these streets within Havana, according to this draft report, which is drafted in fact on the boat uh, on Waring's return to New York, uh, will eventually, it will be adopted by Havana. And you can see in 1901, these images after Waring's death, where indeed the street cleaners of New York City have been replicated um, in Havana as well. So the, the maintenance art and the sweeping um, continues in this act of maintenance and performance and performativity uh, remain some of the most interesting contributions of George E. Waring, Jr. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Catherine, so much. Wonderful story. I can't wait to see how this all develops um, when when the book comes out. Um, so we we have questions, I believe, already lining up, um, and uh, and I so I will get to it. Uh, from Maureen Marlowe, how durable were the tiles wearing used for drainage at the Greeley Farm and at Central Park? They're ceramic. That's a good question, Maureen. Thanks for asking. In fact, I, I know Maureen through her work with the Olmstead Farm on Staten Island. Um, it's, it's a very interesting question. The only way to find the answer is to dig them up to see if they're still intact or if they've become clogged. It's, it's quite interesting in Central Park as well. It's the same technique with ceramic tile. And some areas the park knows, in fact, the Conservancy and, and New York City Parks understand that there has been a change to the, um, the condition of the tiles and the efficacy because wetlands are forming. So essentially there are probably some areas where those ceramic tiles have either crushed or have been clogged. So uh, I don't know if there's any way other than to excavate to determine what the condition of um, under tile draining is. If Khan is asking, when is your book due out? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if my editor's in the audience, but we're working for a spring 2022 or fall 2022 release. Okay, uh, anxiously awaiting, no pressure. Um, <laughs> Elisa Silva asks, the fact that yellow fever was transmitted through a mosquito bite was known in other parts of the Caribbean in Guadalupe Island and in Venezuela because Luis Daniel Bobertui discovered it in 1838 and presented it at the French Academy of Sciences. How is it possible that Waring knew nothing of this even 60 years later? Yes, so well, Walter <clears throat> Reed does not, he's not the sole discoverer of this connection between <clears throat> yellow fever and mosquito, the mosquito bite. And in fact, there's a very, I believe it's fit, Carlos Finlay is a very important scientist who's Cuban, in fact, who comes up with this mosquito theory many decades before Walter's Walter Reed's conclusive evidence. So it's another example of science and um, superiority aligning um, where one party is not believing the scholarship of another. And so I think there is this very interesting moment. Um, it's, it's with the overlap of the germ theory and miasma as well. So there were deniers uh, in both cases of how disease was transmitted. It's, it's very, um, it's, you know, science is a, is a very, you know, human and squishy thing. And I think there's a lot of um, ways of thinking about science which are completely weighted and fraught with biases. And I think part of the reason Finlay's argument and his evidence was never recognized at all of the scientific conferences and medical conferences he attended was because he was Cuban. He was not... Um, born in the United States or had not studied at the institutions within the U.S. or Europe. And that makes them blind to the sort of fact that all of the Caribbean basin is 
cultivating sugarcane, which grows in marshes. Exactly. And the, the map coincides with with the Wet extraction. Land. Exactly. Right. Um, all right, Jay Wilberforce, what do you know about Waring's descendants, if any? Well, he was married and there was one daughter. <laughs> it's kind of a funny story. Um, I found a little bit about his wife, but very little about the offspring. There's a daughter. Um, but the, there's a very funny story. Of, he was cremated on Swinburne and, uh, because of the condition of you know, the fact he had been infected uh, with yellow fever. But there's these very funny, and I don't know, you know what level to see them as uh, true or not, but there are a number of journal uh, newspaper um, articles that talk about the ashes of George Waring and how his wife left for Italy and never came to pick them up. And then someone threw them out and actually used the mug to just, you know, as a, you know, to drink beer, essentially. So there's a very funny, you know, maybe apocryphal, um, but it was, I think there was just one descendant and I'm not sure. It's a great question. I'll have to dig in to see what became of her, but there's uh, apparently um, an interesting relationship. Um. Barry Bergdahl, uh, great lecture. Catherine, how versed do you think Waring was in the hydraulics that were part of contemporary European parks, such as the work of Alphand in Paris? Great question. Hi, Barry. Um, I think this is a good, good question because I don't think his waterworks were um, that demonstrative, let's say. So it's a really good question because so much of the gravity fed fountains and that technology um, was developed in Europe. He did study European farming techniques as did Olmsted, um, but I don't know that he knew or was interested in the performance of water, which is a very interesting question given his interest in performance in general. Like it doesn't, I don't think there's ever an example where he, um, allows water to be displayed in that kind of um, celebratory way that you would see in a fountain. Um, and I don't think that he had much role in the fountains even within Central Park. Um, I think he really was looking at this idea of drainage as something that was really shunting the water away as opposed to displaying it. Um, Michael King asks, um, you mentioned that Merle Leatherman Eucalyptus referred to Waring as the first performance artist. This sounds reminiscent of Robert Smithson's uh, highlighting Olmsted and saying Olmsted was the first earthwork artist. Why do you think these artists are highlighting such 19th century figures and what drew you to Waring? Wow, that's like a multi-part question, Michael. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I think there is there is this incredible um, the fantastic the dialectic landscape um, essay by Robert Smithson, in which he really does posit that that this landscape architect is the first earth artist because he's moving earth and he's placed, you know, he's really thought about how um, the earth can be shaped. I always think about that tunnel on on 79th Street in the Traverse where there's a live rock tunnel that is blasted through, and in fact you see him actually sculpting the earth for um, passage, subterranean passage. Um, that's an interesting question. So why were these 19th century, I think that, you know, there's a, a really fascinating connection, I think between, it's fascinating to think that both Euclides and, and, um, Smithson are looking back to these performers in some ways. And that really speaks a little bit to the performative nature of the work at that time, maybe. I mean, I think this notion of sculpture and land is really pretty fascinating. What was the third part of the question, Anita? Sorry, Michael. Sure, um, what drew you to wearing? What drew me to wearing, yes, absolutely. I really am very curious about marginal figures. And I think I see in wearing, I mean, interestingly, and maybe this could be argued, but I see Burley Marx also as a kind of marginal figure um, in a greater sea of, of um, the modern period, uh, which is one of the reasons I was attracted to him. But I think for Waring, what's fascinating about him is, uh, first of all, he was alongside so many important political figures in the 19th century. 
um, and often, you know, dispatched by presidents to all of these locations around the country and the world, um, really, if you think of the Caribbean Basin as well. Uh, it's interesting to think about how someone like that sees the other things going on around them. And that's why I think those who are marginalized often offer a very interesting read on historic events that we don't always get from the kind of more well-known figures. So I think that's really the, um, the main reason why the interest in wearing, but I think another layered one is uh, this question of the commissioners and being a New Yorker and you know, active at City College. There's a long history at City College to produce commissioners. And I think his role in looking at this kind of historical lineage of the various commissioners and various public agencies is a very fascinating uh, narrative as well. So thank you for that question. I'm going to jump in uh, with my own question um, uh, because it's somewhat related to uh, a few that have been asked. So when um, Olmsted writes uh, public parks and the enlargement of towns, mm -hmm. um, he, you know, he seems to describe in a way the, this kind of um, duality. On the one hand, he he's bringing sort of the experience of nature into the city. Uh, on the other one, he wants to, he's modernizing the city. And one of the signifiers for this is the way he talks about getting rid of mud. So mud, which is, you know, in all sort of the roads of, not only of uh, outside of the city, in the countryside is a problem. Uh, also, of course, Havana is not paved. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and it's it's curious that that the surface is the thing that becomes modernized, but the atmosphere in a way isn't, meaning the trees, the forest, the experience. Um, and did 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 Waring talk about mud also as he's trying to drain? Did he talk about it in in any way? in terms of uh, wanting to modernize uh, the city? I'm trying to think if there's explicit, yes, definitely in his first farming book, it's all about soil. I mean, there's a whole treatise on the plant and then on the soil. And so that is that thing where he's looking at the connection between earth and sky or earth and atmosphere specifically. Um, what one thing that Waring really comes out with, and this is with the, the Cuban recommendations for Havana, um, is what you see is in fact this love for asphaltum, which has really just been developed, and this idea that you could seal the surface. So one of his one of his seven recommendations for Havana is to apply asphaltum, as he calls it, or asphalt surfaces as this um, continuous surface of waterproof material which seals the mud. So it seems weirdly counterintuitive because, of course, he's been working with this notion of drainage, which is implying porosity or that the earth is absorptive and water may pass through it and then be shunted at another, at a lower elevation to um, obtain that dryness or the, the lack of mud. I don't remember, I'll have to look, it's a good question. I wonder if there's explicit references to mud in the urban realm that he makes, but mm -hmm. he's certainly understanding soil from a farmer's perspective. Um, and I think he maintains with him that farmer's perspective throughout his career, though he shifts again much more toward thinking about um, questions of sewage and health, right? So he's he's kind of moving towards this phenomena that's el that's otherly. Um, but I think what's what was really surprising to me was that recommendation for asphalt, which then of course would shunt the water away somewhere else, and that notion that you can't absorb uh, when you seal the mud under a layer of bitumen. Sorry. But it but it also makes the the surface of the city as even in the streets uh, smooth and clean and comforting and comfortable yes. and you can sweep it which of course you cannot sweep mud right anyways yeah. just a, just a <laughs> thought of um, uh, a thought uh, it made me wonder whether he had spoken clearly about this yeah. um, okay um, uh, let's see. Uh, Dr. Nina, I cannot see the rest of your last name. I'm so sorry. Um, 
Did Warren ever explicitly disagree with developing germ theories? Yes, he states very strongly and uh, vehemently his rejection of the germ theory well after its acceptance. And by 1880, it was pretty much understood and accepted in Europe. But he continued to argue against it, I think because of, you know, one could speculate why, but I think he really was a believer in um, that mechanistic operations on the ground could actually, uh, that those were actually proving um, to produce better health. And he argues that his Memphis plan, of course, solved the problem of yellow fever. So in his mind, he's also trying, he's trotting this plan around to other cities. You should use my Memphis separated sewer system. So he's also a salesman to some degree. So he's got to be behind his um, his claim that it has to do with the emanations from the ground and that this is the way to cure that. So I think he has to be, even if deep inside he may not believe it, he has to be forward um, in presenting himself as a champion of the miasma theory. Um, Lisa Thompson says hi from Memphis and oh, great. Uh, asks the city has benefited from the early separation of the storm sewer and the sanitary sewer systems developed by Waring. As a follow up to the first question, over time there has been deterioration of those early, uh, yes, over time there has been deterioration of those early ceramic pipes. Yeah, that's that's good to hear. But I think what's very um, what's telling here, and I think thank you, Lisa. It's great to have someone from Memphis here. Um, there's a separated system, and of course, in New York and Chicago, all of our 19th century cities most have a combined system. So Waring was arguing for separation of uh, sanitary um, sewage and storm sewage. So he produced two separate a separated system that was not now that could not have this kind of outfall problem that we have now. Um, it's pretty interesting, um, but has its issues, of course. Um, okay. Um, does climate variability affect drainage conditions in Central Park? There are, I mean, it's a very, it is mechanical. There are some interesting narratives. I mean, I think there's a couple of things that come to mind with that question. First of all, is freezing, right? So the the uh, recommendations that we see in Horace Greeley, one of the things he states very directly is that um, the, out, the reason these are buried is to stay below the frost line and that the outfall should also be below the frost line because otherwise you have issues with your outfall. So there's... Um, that notion of cold. But I think the more interesting climatic um, condition is that of rainfall. And within Central Park, um, there's a very controlled uh, lake and pond level. So both the lake and the pond can be mechanically um, drained to some degree in order to accommodate rainfall. So interestingly, because these are low points, um, both the, la the lake at the southern part of the Ramble and the pond at the south southeastern corner of the park, um, both are drained in anticipation of heavy rainfall by park's staff in order to accommodate the influx of more rainfall so that the, the whole system is not overwhelmed. So there is a kind of controlling um, that is done through the system of drains within the park. So there's the ability to kind of both hold and, and hold in reserve as a, as a kind of detention mechanism um, within the lakes. I hope that might answer the question, but I think that the bigger question is really that one of, of rainfall in terms of thinking about how climate um, transformations are going to be much more impactful moving forward. Increased in hotter and wetter days is the real impact here. Mm -hmm. Um, and Jacob asks, what was done with the water after it was collected? Uh, is, I think this is, um, the water is being really sheeted along. So the, I'll answer that maybe specifically as to uh, within Central Park. So the water is, is being sent to these low points, but then it outfalls into the city sewer system. So it goes into the storm sewers from the low points of the park. So it actually, it doesn't stay within the park um, 
specific, it's never fully managed by the park itself. It actually outfalls when it reaches a certain elevation of water um, out to the sewage system and then out to, to the East River. Okay. Daniel Toner asks, can you say more about what was in Central Park beforehand and what was erased? Yeah, I think that there were a number, you can see on that, actually the municipal archives of the city of New York has that first um, survey made in 1857 by um, Egbert Veeley. And there he's actually drawing in red every structure which exists in the park at that time. So that survey was really a survey of all of the built structures within the perimeter of the land which was being set apart by, by the Central Park Act as public land. Um, so the red is telling, it's probably, it means demo, right? So all of everything that's in red on that plan will be demolished. Um, Seneca Village, certainly that was one of the kind of clusters of owned homes um, on that kind of central western side of the park. But there was also Mount St. Vincent. There was a um, large complex of buildings in the northeastern corner of the park as well. And then you see houses throughout the entire park. There's actually a little scattering of structures throughout. So um, there was uh, quite, I mean, it was still farmland in general around that area at the time. Um, certainly not anything like we have now, but um, all of those structures were de demolition, de demoed by the um, the unveiling of the park and the creation of Central Park. Okay, um, a question from our own Dean, Sarah Whiting. What a terrific talk on such an amazing topic, Catherine, thank you. My question concerns expertise. Can you speak to the expertise that Waring brought to this world of health-driven landscape engineering design and how expertise plays out today? This generalism seems to be something that you share, but that is not reflected, I would argue, in professional practice today. Wow. Yeah. So expertise. I mean, I think certainly what Waring brought. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for that. That question is great. I think the um, this is interesting. So this question of um, what does he bring? He he learned everything he could about farming. And I think this was from a very early age. Um, so his books are prolific and and very um, detailed. He's really struggling with this question of scientific farming. He sees himself as a scientific farmer um, who has expertise indeed in ideas of um, terrain, ground, plants, and manure, how to use manure fertilizer, right? So he's looking at these all these layers of how it's like early earth sciences in a way of how to understand um, the earth and the climate and the atmosphere. So there's this really deep study. As he moves through this kind of series of, you can think about him as moving through these books or as this series of chapters in a way of his own life. And I think often we see this in these late 19th century figures, the disruption of the war. And so, so many of these uh, men who are taking these kind of roles and then shifting their roles as disrupted by that period of the Civil War uh, which produces other kinds of expertise, I believe, but it also creates these these ruptures, I think. And it's interesting to think that each rupture and when he's moving from place to place, something new enters in and he tries to dig in again with this sort of desire to understand how everything works. And so in some ways, his expertise is really that um, that drive, whatever it might be, to find these ways of uh, narratives that work for the solutionism that he's proposing, right, which is fraught. So um, there's not always, in fact, many of his solutions have very um, unintended, unintended but real and um, serious consequences as well. But I think that his kind of moving from place to place, from job to job in a way, um, and the situations in which he finds himself allows him to shift from not only only looking at the question of agriculture and the plant, but then beginning to look at questions of health and hygiene and then to um, ongoing questions which start to get very explicitly played out from the Department of Sanitation or the Department of Street Cleaning, as it was called at that time, to Cuba, where it starts to address questions of race, class and morality. And so I think we see 
um, some infection of this kind of pure earth science with some of the um, the morals of the day, in fact, and and um, that starts to layer in as well, in not always a good way. Mm -hmm. Was Waring a colonialist? If so, did he think that drainage would help further U.S. colonial intentions in the Caribbean and the Philippines? Yeah, I, he didn't work in the Philippines, but of course that's the same period um, of expansionism, 1898. Um, I think that all farmers in some ways are colonialists in that there there is a kind of settling that's happening there and a transformation of land use from one thing to another. So I think uh, definitely, I, I would say, I don't know that he, um, it's interesting to think where his politics would have been in all the American uh, support of the Spanish-American War was very strong. Um, and I think that the, his parody in some ways with Robert Porter, who was there looking at industrial Cuba, I would have to say, yes, he was on board with this mission that he had been um, given, right, by Rutherford to go and see um, how to improve the condition on the ground for these white settlers who didn't have uh, a kind of history of an immune system that had been you know, primed with the, with mosquito bites from childhood, and and so therefore less more likely to become ill with yellow fever. I mean, this was really what was causing all of the uh, the illnesses with the with the white soldiers uh, who were not from the region. But I think he must have been, you know, he just lost his job again. So you know, once one mayor goes down, Strong was at the end of his mayorship. That was the end of his term as commissioner. So he needed to find work. And he saw, I believe, a way to model another kind of street cleaning department for Cuba. So, of course, his livelihood was going to depend on the success of that project. And I think the fundamental um, mission of the project was to think about how to be, create profit, again, training for health and profit. Uh, in this case, profit from uh, the exploitation of Every, whatever the industries of Cuba could and were, right? And how those had been exploited in the past, of course, is known. But so, yeah, I guess he was part of that Ameri American imperial colonialist moment. All right. And then one last uh, question slash comment from Fadi Masood. Hello from Toronto. Great lecture. Super fascinating work and incredibly relevant parallel to a world that links public health discourse to the role of the shared public urban surface right away. Uh, especially in an era of increased flooding, vulnerability, and a global pandemic. Uh, so many excellent lessons to be learned, especially for landscape architects and planners everywhere. It's true. It's interesting because this project's been going on for a couple of years. Pre, it was pre-pandemic. It's a pre-pandemic project, and everything we look at now goes. We have to put on our pandemic lenses and think about everything again, um, mm -hmm. which I think is very. Uh, it's a. It's an interesting time to rethink wearing for sure because he's really um, at this moment where he's looking at the public landscape as something that is very much about um, supporting health and. Uh, that he sees a way to think, make things more hygienic, and he believes it's in the air, right? He thinks disease is in the air. And so there's this hyper clean thing that you see even in his portrait seated with the gloves in this very fastidious way. Um, he was probably a neat freak, right? He probably had, you know, filth issues. Um, and I think that there's something kind of parallel happening now where, you know, our relationship with microbes has become completely, as we were just starting to get along, uh, everyone's really kind of thinking about another way of dealing or masking and filtering our, our contact with the air and the atmosphere. And so I think there's, there's some kind of questions which are certainly in the air and that are um, very much powerful now at this moment, um, that this will be an interesting way to kind of look at history through a different lens and think about how we might look forward as well. Okay, and then one last question from Lisa Thompson. Can you comment on Waring's contribution to the development of standards and practices for the design of urban drain systems? 
especially in the U.S. with smaller step-down pipe sizes compared with European approaches at the time using larger pipe size, wow, such yeah. as in Paris, etc. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I can't speak to that with great expertise, but I think it is interesting the small size of the pipes that were deployed in this drainage, uh, the field drainage that Waring was doing and then transfers mm -hmm. to the park. Um, there are a few larger, I think those black lines that you see on his drainage plan for Central Park are some, some are 24 inch pipes, but I think they're generally very, very small. And it was seen as this kind of, um, uh, you know, it's quite a minimal structure. And even his separated sewage systems, again, in, in Memphis, uh, were very small diameter pipes. And so it's an interesting question that I've, I'll look further into, but um, it's a question about sizing and um, efficacy and flushing as well, right? I think that's where the problem with the smaller pipes um, starts to be, you know, problematic is the, the question of, of clog and flush. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, this was a wonderful talk. Uh, we, I think many people will look forward to the publication of, of your book. Uh, thank you to the audience also for all your wonderful questions. And I want to also thank um, Matt, Paige, and Kat from the communications office. Uh, this is our last event of the year. It's been a wonderful year. Thank you for your help um, and for making everything so smooth in such a challenging moment. So good night, everyone. And uh, we'll see you soon.